That's an amazing statistic. It time is. after time, he's tried to give him a three point basket, especially late, but he has not aggressively sought the shot. It is amazing. I mean, we want to credit the the Detroit Pistons defense some, but at the same time, Jordan appears to have been very concerned about making sure that his teammates got involved in the game and has not been looking at the hoop. And the last time he did not feel well, he had a little case of the flu and wasn't scoring the ball, but at least he was looking to shoot it. This time, when he's having an off-ball game, he just has not put the ball in the air. These three legends happen to have three things in common. A. They've all been discussed as the GOAT at one time or another. B. They've had critics play dumb and pretend they didn't really know how good they were to push a certain agenda. And C. They've all dealt with receding hairlines and or total hair loss. So actually four things because D. They've all been accused of quitting at some point in their careers. Yes, even Michael Jordan, whose non-gambling related flaws are so well hidden on the interwebs these days that I've rarely ever seen the playoff failure that we're about to discuss ever brought up. It's just buried in this little pocket of the internet, pretty much enshrouded by the rest of his struggles with the bad boys pistons. However, this one is very specific. So over the next few videos, we're going to play a little game called Did He Quit? And we're going to look at what actually happened on the floor of these games where critics either say they mentally checked out or in this case, they called the player something to the effect of a very high paid decoy. And man, wouldn't it have been amazing to have the seat geek app to witness Michael Jordan duel with the bad boy pistons live. SeatGeek is without a doubt the best way to buy tickets on the web, and that goes for any kind of event, which is most likely going to be sports related for you all. Just search up the event you'd like tickets to, and SeatGeek has already got everything arranged by both score and color to let you know what type of deal you're getting. It starts out at green for the best, and lowers in quality the closer you get to red. Also, it's extremely useful that once you found the ticket you want, SeatGeek actually shows you the exact view you'll be getting when you get to that seat. That is by far my favorite feature, so be sure to visit SeatGeek with the link in both the comment section and description and for $20 off of your first purchase, use my code DOM2K and you'll be on your way. So some very general notes to know about this game. This is in the 1989 Eastern Conference Finals, Bulls vs Pistons Game 5 with the series tied. Jordan has already done Jordan things in this series as he's had a 46 point game and a 32 point game. However, in a tied series in Game 5, which is the point where a team really needs a superstar player, probably the most aside from a Game 7, Jordan plays 46 minutes only attempts 8 shots, scores 18 points which is only 3 off from being his lowest scoring playoff game in his career, but dishes out 9 assists and grabs 5 rebounds. Yet as you heard at the beginning of the video, this is an extremely uncharacteristic game for Jordan, even in a time where he had not yet conquered the bad boy pistons. But when you start looking at him being called a decoy and people coming back through history to say that he quit on his team in this game, they're looking at the 8 field goal attempts. That may be further backed when you watch the footage and you see See him pretty content to just not be aggressive at some points, not really attack, and overall just not do Jordan things. However, let's take a moment to consider what the strategy was coming into this game. Doug Collins had Michael Jordan playing point guard for all intents and purposes, and with that, there was a large focus in A playing out of the post, and B trying to get his teammates involved in response to the type of coverage he was seeing throughout that series and especially in this game. And speaking of that, what coverage did we see in this game? Well, it was basically called, we're not losing to Michael fucking Jordan. This involved extreme coverage and always having at least one guy ready to help or in a lot of cases just flat out double teaming him to the point that his teammates were getting wide open shots. Now due to that fact they were able to stay in this game pretty much all the way into the fourth quarter until Vinny Johnson came in and really just busted the entire Bulls team's ass. And that's where it didn't help that Michael was really being more of a facilitator this game rather than the regular scoring 40 points Michael Jordan because as Vinny Johnson began to put the game out of reach Michael Jordan was in no kind of rhythm and he was still seeing the same type of coverages even if he wanted to find a rhythm. It started pretty early as you can see here, Paxson is going to get Jordan the ball and the literal minute he catches it, he sees not one, not two, but three bodies. There's an attempt to double team and he tries to escape to the left, big man is right in the paint, and he could have lifted off for a shot here. That would probably be considered a bad shot. It would have been off balance and contested, that is definitely a 90% coverage in 2k. And so really being the point guard and being in the point guard mindset this game, he makes the right play by giving it off to Paxson who just clanks the shot. 
Also, one more note, as he was making his drive here, notice how all the Pistons are looking at him. Isaiah Thomas is not worried about Paxson in the slightest. Nobody is worried about anybody else other than Michael Jordan on the floor, and it's a very common theme. Michael was actually looking for a shot here off the pick, and the Pistons were not having it. Isaiah Thomas to the side, big man in the front. Yeah, there's no, there's no good way to even force this shot. He makes the correct pass. Clank. So yes, there's many plays just like this where he's going to draw the defense and his teammate is either going to make it or they're not. But yes, in those situations, there wasn't much more for him to do. Out of rhythm by the fact that he was facilitating most of this game, there were certain plays where he just tried to be Jordan and the Pistons defense forced him into mistakes. So if he wasn't going to look for the correct pass or he didn't have the angle for one, you got a result like you have right here where the double team comes, he sees a side of the floor that he believes he can get to, but in this instance, he just ends up stepping out of bounds and it's a turnover. You have plays like this where at a glance, it seems he wasn't being aggressive when in reality, there really weren't that many great lanes of attack. Dumars here applies heavy ball pressure and Jordan tries to cut left. He tries to get something going in the offense with an aggressive move. However, all he finds is a crowded paint, runs right into defense and he has to get rid of it. Now the ball does swing as he cuts and resets and it's about this time where it looks like the floor is maybe as clear as it would be all night. He's got his back to the basket, maybe a spin to the left and no hard double as Isaiah Thomas is really just showing. However, a quick spin to the baseline would almost immediately subject him to a crowded paint. He would not make it far before being doubled. However, that still would have likely resulted in an open teammate, maybe an open shot. However, this is more credit to Detroit's defense than Jordan just quitting or not being as aggressive. As you've already seen from the footage, he made the right plays most of the night. He drew the defense in more times than he didn't. Look at the beauty here. Jordan is going to take the pick. They are going to immediately double him off the pick, but that's not all that's going on here. It might look like he has Pippen on the wing for a three-pointer. No, that is completely covered. A defender has already been notified and is heading that way. And from the looks of things, he actually changed his mind here. It seems as he came off of the pick, he had decided he was going to throw a pass. As he sees that pass is shut off, it seems that he changes his mind to a cutting John Paxson who was really not at a good angle for this, which is why he ends up fumbling it. And obviously the screen setter is in place as he's already decided to pass, so there were not many options here. Detroit covered them all. On this play, Detroit takes it upon themselves to double Michael multiple feet behind the three-point line after a pick and roll, and they just recover everything beautifully. Getting Michael this far out, there is time for a defender to recover to the three-point line and for Dennis Rodman to recover to the post. While that's going on, even as the ball makes its way to what seems to be an open Pippen, he's covered. And that effectively kills this possession by the time it's off to the right wing. So in this play, they were able to trap Jordan far past where he was even a threat and totally neutralize all options created by that. So as not to be redundant, just one more variation here, covering Jordan off ball. If the Pistons weren't doubling him as a ball, handler, Dumars was not about to allow any easy catches. Check this play as Jordan attempts to cut back door. Of course, there's no pass there. Dumars was screened here, so he's a bit over the play. That gives Jordan the chance to try to shake him off, and Dumars stays right with him despite all these bodies cutting off his vision, or at least obstructing it. He literally telegraphs Jordan's moves here before stealing the ball, and by this point, Detroit pretty much had all the momentum in the game. 10 of Michael Jordan's 18 points that night came off of free throws, and when he did manage to score from the field, it wasn't anything that came easy. So after this game, which goes down as one of Jordan's worst playoff scoring performances you'll ever see, the article pops up that Jordan disappeared versus the Pistons, and it is insinuated that the Bulls turned him into a $2.5 million decoy, referring to the fact that when he was controlling the ball, he was essentially kicking it out instead of looking for his shot, and that when he wasn't controlling the ball, it was more or less just about his gravity. Coach Doug Collins responded by saying, quote, Michael scores 46 points and people saying he's not sharing enough of the offense. Now he takes just eight shots and you tell him he's the highest priced decoy in the game. Is that fair? Jordan responds to the criticism by saying, quote, why should I take the shots if they're double teaming me, triple teaming me, sometimes even putting four guys on me? Didn't we still get good shots? The answer to that, of course, as you see in the footage is yes. And to that he responds, well, did we hit him? And as you could also see from the footage, despite the Bulls as a team shooting 49% that night, a lot of the passes that came from Jordan being doubled or pressured, those were really the ones that weren't falling and that's why Detroit was so intent on, especially by the end of the game, really just leaving anybody else open. And to that, Jordan finishes by saying, quote, I feel good. I don't feel tired. There's nothing wrong with me, but I'm going to say it again. I'm not going to force anything. I can't shoot with their whole team on me. And if the other guys hit their shot, we win, plain and simple. 
So in 2019 on NBA Twitter, that would be called blame game, that would be called excuses, yet the footage does not lie. And the strategy that game from Doug Collins was simple. Michael Jordan point guard, get the teammates involved, and that was in response not only to the type of coverage he'd been seeing, but also to the fact that the Pistons were so deep. For reference, they were able to practically bench Bill Lambeer by the fourth quarter as he only played 24 minutes total, and same with Isaiah Thomas playing 32 minutes, yet they didn't miss a beat. So to counteract the amount of fresh bodies that the Pistons could just throw at them, the Bulls went with a more inclusive offense, and it just didn't pan out. One thing that Doug Collins did go on to mention that Michael Jordan refused to go into was the fact that the Bulls had played a full five game series with the Cavaliers, they were able to take that with Michael Jordan averaging 35 points a game. Then in the semifinals, they had a six game battle with the Knicks in which Jordan averaged 40. The Pistons on the other hand were well rested as they enjoyed sweeps in their first two rounds. So while Jordan refused to go that route, Doug Collins did say, yes, they're wearing us down. Yes, we're probably tired. Yes, Michael is probably tired. And that's why I tried to use some new people. These guys leave Lambeer, Isaiah, and Aguirre on the bench and don't even miss them. So ultimately, you come to your own conclusion. However, personally, I am going to go with no, Jordan did not quit. When you take into account context, the game plans from both Doug Collins and the Pistons, and most importantly, the footage, it seems fairly obvious that the X's and O's were not lined up for Jordan to go off in this game 5. And while he could have probably forced up 10 more off-balance shots, contested shots, double team shots, I'm thinking they would have probably lost by more than they did. Again, they were in that game till the very end. Four shots in this specific game seemed like they would have probably led to a blowout. So that's it for this edition of Did He Quit. I'll be back with LeBron and Kobe next. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also comment and subscribe and hit the bell next to my name if you want notifications every time a video drops. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all on the next one.